Well, I, I was smart. I was in college. I didn't have a car, but I had a girlfriend and she had a car. So that was, you know, that, <laughs> that, that worked out nicely. That worked out. So. Well, I live in New York City. I didn't need a car. Well, that's the thing, you know, in West New York, I was in West New York and I, I've never needed oh, a vehicle yeah. for anything. And, and when I did go anywhere, actually, I used to love to ride my bicycle. So yeah. I was always on my bike. I never had to worry about anything like that. But once I got to college, oh, my goodness, it was just a different world. It was, it was first of all, it was Exocells, New Jersey. So it was like isolated, not really. Wow. And so you, everywhere you went, you needed something. So. Uh, but thank God I had I had good friends uh, in Bible college that uh, helped me out a lot. You know, you know, if they were going to go to the market, they would tell me, hey, I'm going to my market. You want to go, you know. Or, and I had a friend who's actually uh, he was so sweet every single weekend. He was kind enough to even drive me home, you know, like 20, 30, 30 minute drive. So mm, I could be able, really? so I could be able to the weekend at my house with my mom. But uh, that didn't last very long either because I. I oh, West New York is like noise pollution i told mom mom i enjoy coming out here it's great to have home cooking but <laughs> this is hell i can't do any work out here it's just did you home. work you lived in west new york yeah it's worse today now. oh yeah now it's worse i go i only know of it because i i go to the eye doctor there oh it's horrible horrible now. i don't know about it but it looks you know <laughs> i never oh, trust me. even when i was a kid i was like i was what was what well i was 18 19 when i was in college and just go home on the weekends it's just like uh the boom box uh the sirens the noise i was like oh, really was even it. at that time huh? even at that time so you can imagine now that it's been so <laughs> multiplied um wow. in west new york actually i did i did once i don't know if it still is but uh, in my 20s, I was doing ministry there, and so I was studying studying and more about the area and the people and learning more, and I found out that it was the most densely populated place in all the USA. Really? Wow. Yeah. West New York, huh. most densely populated per, per uh, square yard, has more people than anywhere else in the United States. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, I said, well, that explains that, because <laughs> it was horrible. It was hell. You know, it, it kind of that 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 that's where you can read uh, John Paul Sartre. Jean Paul Sartre says, "Hell is other people." Yeah, that's that's West New York right there because unbelievable, unbelievable. But and now and now this area is getting noisy too. It's starting to starting to be amazing. I mean, it's not as bad as West New York ever, thank God. But here I hear noises now that I never heard when I first got here some twenty something years ago. It was so yeah. nice. Well, Building wherever there is ground, they're building there, oh, even yeah. if it's out of place. Yeah, and what they do now is that they actually build on, you know, like a, well, a lot of one families around here are becoming two families. And then they build that monstrosity right in the middle of town. That huge, isn't, that, isn't that ridiculous? It I, makes the whole place look. Yeah, but see, that's where, that's where we have to see. So oh, I'm recording this, but who cares? That's what we have to say to you. So look who's making money. See, that's the only way you're going to do something like that. Somebody made a lot of money by having sure. that monstrosity there. And uh, because obviously it destroys, it destroys Cliffside Park. Uh, it's no longer a nice little place. And, that's, and, and every single day now, if you start, you know, around 3 to 5 p.m., that Bergen line there, that Anderson Avenue becomes like heavy grid. So this really? drive, I literally had to find my way around it. I can no longer drive on Anderson around that time because like, for example, I, tomorrow at 3, 3.45, I head out to take my daughter to her piano class. Sometimes I literally have to go to the left, go down towards Palisade Avenue and go around. And it's, just th it's only four blocks and then make a left. That's how bad it is that I have to go the other way to, uh, mm -hmm. to get there faster, you know, so. But... Yeah, what can you do? They can always blame the Hispanics for moving into this area, and then, then eventually I'll retire and head down to North Carolina. They can blame Hispanics for destroying North Carolina. No, that's all you hear on the phone. What was that? That's all you hear is Spanish on the phone before they even uh, start talking, asking who it is in English. Really? Oh. Yeah. Funny, I don't I hear Spanish. I actually, I mostly when I call anywhere, I hear Indians. I, yeah. 
Hello, really? can I help you? No, I'm I, I, I ordered from Papa John. I'm like, hello, can I help you? And I'm thinking this guy is not in America. It's somewhere, some guy in, somewhere else <laughs> taking my order. You know? Maybe he's from Italy. <laughs> yeah, but, but I but I don't get it. I don't get Hispanics. I make it easier for me. I'd be like, oh, oh, like one time, chico. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank mm. uh, that we can be here again this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the just the blessing, dear God, of uh, 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 and privilege of being able to be into your word and to study it and to learn more and more about it, dear God. Just guide us, uh, guide our conversation, that everything, Father, will be for your glory. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're still in Philippians chapter one. We have started uh, dealing with the verses. We're going to read those two verses again. Victor, if you do us the honor of reading uh, verse one and two. One and two. Yeah, Philippians chapter one, verses one and two. Uh, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's people in Christ Jesus of Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Any 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 quick questions on that before we jump into it again? No. Well, we left off at the overseers and deacons. Um, and this is very interesting because this is the first mention of these offices or individuals. Um, also, Paul will go on say uh, go on and say anything else. Uh, will not go on to say anything else about them. He just mentions them here at the beginning. Uh, they're also mentioned, of course, in the pastoral epistles in First, Second Timothy, and Titus. And uh, in the pastoral epistles, usually um, uh, not only being ascribed to a later date, mm -hmm. uh, but some people ascribe it, don't even, many biblical scholars don't even ascribe the pastoral letters, uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus to, to Paul. They'll say somebody else wrote it. And they'll say, you know, and again, they have this, uh, this thing, that, this theory that built up, and I mentioned it last week, that somehow the early churches were charismatic and more like, you know, shooting from the hip. And now, as the time went on, they became institutionalized. But here we see Philippians, which is a very early letter from around the mid-50s, already mentioning these individuals. Um, and again, it's not so much that these are um, that these are like cemented offices. This is not as, as cement. I mean, slowly it becomes more cemented. But at the beginning, it's more of a function. These, mm -hmm. are, these are things like, you know, if you talk to these people, these probably people who have been gifted, been graced uh, by God to have certain, certain things that they do in church because they have these uh, gifts, uh, but it's functional. Uh, the overseers, the deacons are functional. And of course, they also become eventually titles for these people. Now, why Paul would mention them even here at all, uh, I think it's correct that the reason he does this is because... Um, He's going to deal with the issue of leadership with Eodia and Syndicate, who are two women in church who are who are uh, bickering and fighting with each other. And mm -hmm. so he does right at the beginning call upon the leadership, and then he's going to call upon them in chapter four to intervene and to and to help them to to reconcile to to deal with their problems. Uh, exactly as, as one uh, finds in the earliest letters of Paul, and here and uh, the references are always in the plural. There's no evidence that there was only one overseer or like a head overseer, um, and or one head deacon. It was you know the episcopoi, the the elders, the overseers, and the diaconos, the ministers, the deacons. And but they're always in the plural, not in the singular. And this also, you know, we see it. We see, of course, that in the early church, there was no one set of way of doing things that, you know, despite all, all the instructions were given about doctrinal issues or moral issues, we're never given like this is the way you have to perform church government. You know, and I remember I got into a discussion with that once with a young man who was uh, he basically was telling me that, you know, and this was in a business meeting too, which was funny because his father was a trustee and he was talking about the, the way leadership should be. And, you know, there being more than one, not like a pastor, but elders and deacons. And I said, well, if you really believe that, then, you know, your dad's a trustee, then there should be no trustees in church. The trustees are never mentioned in the New Testament. Um, the fact is that there is no one format 
for the church. And in our particular church, we have the pastor, we have the deacons, and we have the trustees. Mm -hmm. And the trustees handle the financial aspect of the church primarily, the building, the monies, and the deacons handle the spiritual aspects of the church. So, you know, uh, ironically, when, for example, I had a person come this week and um, they wanted to rent the church. I didn't turn to a trustees. I turned first to my deacons. I turned to my spiritual guidance and asked them what they thought about it. Of course, we found mm. out the lady was actually, uh, she was being very deceptive because she made a sound. There's about, um, oh, what's the thing? Fairview Gospel Church, which is down at, um, down near Tunley Avenue. Uh, yeah, I know what it is. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, used to, used to, used yeah. to be a Yankee diner there. Yeah, apparently they're closing up. The church is closed. Really? Yeah. Now is there is a Noches of Colombia. Yeah, it's right next to the Noches of Colombia. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. Terrific. They're place. closing up? No kidding. Yeah, yeah. So they, they apparently were there. Uh, this group was using that facility for, they said, 35 years. But when they told James about it, they made it sound like... Uh, like they like like she was part of the church so that's mm -hmm. why i talked to my deacons because i thought i'm not, I'm just I'm not going to dismiss her but when i called her say well you know the the deacons want to sit down and meet with you and talk about the church and your your church and is, is your pastor still going to be with you blah 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 uh then i found out that, that she was in the church they were using the church and they're actually what's called and i never heard of this one na you know what na is na yeah not applicable no, it's Narcotics Anonymous. I had, I had never, <laughs> heard, never heard of a Narcotics and I heard of AA. I never heard of our Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, I said, well, you know, I have to get back to you. Of course, the deacons, you know, I talked to them and said, oh, no way. No way. We can't, we can't allow that to happen. But, um, but again, mm. you, know, uh, you know, just that, all that to say that there are different forms of government and church. And so how I deal with things, not, you know, when it's a business issue, I go to trustees. When it's a, spiritual issue i go to my deacons that I, I normally don't go to my trustees unless unless it becomes if we then agree to to allow this this group to use it then of course then i have to turn to the trustees for financial issues and uh the building issue but first i wanted to get the spiritual aspect out of the way and do that correctly mm -hmm. um now the reformed church it's elders and deacons right if i remember correctly six elders, yeah, elders and deacons six elders six deacons is that it I don't remember. Well, the number I don't know. Mm -hmm. We we used to have like a two, two or three elders. Okay, max. I thought I it, I thought it was supposed to be like the whole imagery of the twelve and and the one, six elders. We didn't have enough people. Oh, six elders, six, six deacons, and the pastor, being like the deciding vote if anything works. Well, that's the ideal thing, I guess. But we yeah. didn't have much people. Yeah, you see, and, and for us, it's very different because I, I, don't, I don't like that. Well, except for the fact that my trustees are my deacons, but I really don't like the two things meshing together. And uh, uh -huh. I, so I think that's why it's good to have different positions, handle different things and, and keep them, you know, almost like the government. You know, you have the executive branch, the legislative branch, the, you know, and, and keep it separate. Don't, don't, don't mix them up. Uh. Uh, any questions, anything before we, before I jump into further uh, aspects about this? Uh, well, the overseers, of course, like I mentioned before, is the Episcopoi. Uh, Episcopos is a singular. Uh, it's a title for one form of leadership in the New Testament. Uh, and of course, it's very shrouded with ministry because we really are never given, except for First Timothy, where we're told more about, um, again, we're not even told much about the, the function. We're told more about the character. If you look at 1 Timothy 3, when we were there, it told us more about what kind of person should be a, an elder, what kind of person mm -hmm. should be, not even like, oh, you know, they, they should be this, no, they should be hospitable, they should be this, they should be that, that kind of thing. Uh, so again, it was more looking at the function than an office. The, the first clue to understanding lies with the verb from which is derived uh, the primary uh, meaning of visit, to look after, to care for. Uh, Paul in Acts chapter 20, when he's saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, uh, he urges them to give heed to the flock. And now some translation says over whom, but actually it says it really in the Greek it says among whom the Holy Spirit has placed you as episcopoi to be shepherds to God's people. So they were the ones who were supposed to supervise. Again, in the church, there's not supposed to be the idea of a hierarchy. 
you know, this idea, you know, this this came in later on in the church where you have the bishops mm-hmm. and the popes and things like that. But it was not meant to be that way. It was to be, be a family of equals. And among them, you had these individuals who then had the moral and spiritual responsibility to look after the flock. Uh, of course, at that point, you do get into questions of, you know, uh, discipline and things like that. But it was not supposed to be discipline as like, you know, somebody up here looking down, but it's all brothers and sisters in Christ working together. But you mm-hmm. had people who were in charge of certain things. And the Episcopal were in charge of overseeing the congregation. Uh, the spiritual need to take care of them and, and to uh, to visit them, to to look in on them, take care of them that way. Um, and, and like I mentioned, in First Timothy, the whole thing becomes more about uh, character than anything else. So again, we never we never have like a job description. So today, when you see so many people getting caught up on like you know, well, a pastor has to be this or that, it's all very subjective. We certainly should be looking for the character. Uh, they should be somebody who who who, uh, who is gentle, who who is uh, who is Christ uh, Christ centered, who is focused on preaching and teaching things like that. But when we start getting dogmatic about it, it's not good. The character is what we should, really should be looking at. Now, of course, today because of the world that we live in, uh, I do agree when I see people saying the pastors should have certain qualifications. They they should know their Bible. They should be students of the Word of God. They should. They should have a real, not, not, you don't have to be experts, but you should have some mm-hmm. sort of working knowledge of the languages and the culture and the things of the Bible. I mean, the Bible is the primary text. Right. The thing we do. So if you don't really have a good handle on the word of God, um, and like I said before, I mean, look, when I had to go to Bible college and then I went to seminary, I didn't like it. At first I was like, ah, oh. but you know, when you, when you come out, you begin to see how, it's so important in the formation of things to understand the word of God that way. Because when I see certain, like I said, when I see certain people who are not trained um, trying to lead a church, you see their, their incompetence on, on a number of levels, even biblically. They'll say things biblically that it's, well, if you knew you're Greek or if you were studying the word of God, you will learn that, well, that's not what it says, you know? And, 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 they're kind of like not cohesive because you know, you know what seminary forces you to do is be cohesive to put together <laughs> your whole theology and again to be orthodox because if you really haven't studied him you really don't know the word of god it's so easy to to entertain ideas that really are not are not biblical they're heretical mm-hmm. and they come into a church through through different vehicles sometimes unfortunately through uh some respected teacher that people are respected and they say something that really doesn't align with uh with the truth of the gospel but again the the, the main the main feature is uh is is functional is is caring caring about the flock and character not not really uh job description any question mm-hmm. uh deacons again is one of the most difficult terms because paul uses it in a multi in multiple ways i mean if we were to translate the word deacon as deacon every single time paul used it uh, we were we were very get very confused because that's one of those words that he has a, a lot of meanings. It means a servant, and that's the most common usage in Paul. Uh, for example, he uses it of Christ that Christ is a servant. He uses it in Romans thirteen to talk about government officials officials that they are the ministers. He says, uh, and that word there is diakonos. Um, he uses it of himself. He uses it of his coworkers. Um, and again, like the overseer, it's functional. Um, but there is a place where you can tell it becomes more like a title. Uh, when we look at the book of Acts, and it says to assign, you know, there was a, a problem among the among the Hebrews and Greeks that uh, the Greek uh, widows were not being taken care of properly. Right. And so at that point, they say, assign men from among you who are full of the Holy Spirit, et cetera, et cetera, who can do these things. And at that point, mm-hmm. you tell it becomes a more specific office a t- more more defined mm-hmm. so although the word can be used for a servant it also has a sense of someone who ministers to the physical needs of congregations you know, through helping the poor things of that nature and uh for example in, in Romans 16 paul describes phoebe as a diaconus uh and again we saw when we look at first timothy chapter 3 that 
Um, it's very possible that deacons served as deacons and their wives also served as deaconess. So, but again, there was no there was no female form of either episcopos or diaconos. There was no uh, feminine form. So, uh, Paul uses only the masculine form, but he, he seems to refer to women as being deacons also in First Timothy three, and uh, obviously Phoebe is uh, is mentioned in that light as well. Uh, again, these people have very general oversight, but uh, so the the overseers are looking more at spiritual things, oversight of the congregation, and deacons are more and the physical needs. Of the people in the car, yeah. take care, take care of the poor, things like that. Any questions? Yeah, they, they would wait on tables. Yeah, the deacons. Yeah, so again, that kind of ministering to the physical needs. And again, I do agree that I think the reason Paul is bringing them in because again, he never mentions these unless only here and in the pastorals. So I think it's because here there's a relevant issue because of the problem they're having in that, mm -hmm. in, that in that church. Uh, verse 2, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the traditional greeting in the Hellenistic world was uh, Karin, which is kind of like grace, which means something like rejoice um, or greetings. And Paul replaces that with grace and peace. Uh, of course, the grace is the grace that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, mm -hmm. it's the grace that God has demonstrated to us. And Paul, again, Paul never uses these words like in a flippant way. You know, like you know, peace or grace. He doesn't. He doesn't. He he has the substance of what he means. It's the grace of God and of Christ that has been demonstrated to us in the fact that we were sinners and Christ saved us. And because we have the grace of God, it follows that we have the peace with God. It's because of the grace of God that we have peace with God. So again, these two are very, uh, very tightly connected. Uh, and again, for peace for Paul, it's not simply, um, like I mentioned before, it's not simply a, oh, there's no hostility. It means the presence of harmony, of wholeness, uh, connected with the Hebrew word, of course, shalom. And, um, and when we deal with Paul, you know, I, which I should mention every time prior we talk about Paul, Paul is a man of different worlds, and actually three worlds. He's, a, you know, when we look at him, we always should look at, what he, at things that he says from the Hebrew perspective, obviously he's among Gentiles, so we should look at it from the Roman perspective, but then he really does identify himself as a believer, as a Christian, and that's a third world for him. He sees everything, mm -hmm. even the Hebrew world, even the Roman world, he sees it through the lens of Christ. And so when we're reading Paul, we should take all those three things into account, the Hebrew aspect, the Roman aspect, and undoubtedly the Christian aspect, which is how he defines himself. Any questions? Okay, so let's go on to the next section, verses 3 to 8. Victor, will you do us the honor of reading that for us, please? Yeah. <clears throat> Verse 3. Uh, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have, I have you in my heart, and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you sharing God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll stop there. Any, any initial questions? No, well, he's very devoted to the uh, to the church. Yes, and but they're is. very and, and they are very devoted to him. Uh, it's one of these churches where you see that there is great intimacy. You know this this language of affection that he says uh, that I, yeah. I am in your heart, you are in my heart. Um, uh, let's see, since I have you in my heart, you know. Uh, and God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Um, even though they're miles apart, even though he hasn't seen them in a while, because again, Paul didn't spend a great deal of time in, in Philippi. Uh, mm -hmm. He has a, a great deal of love and intimacy with them and cares about them. Now today, that language, that kind of language is very, is very common for us. Uh, oh, you're so dear to me. You're in my heart. You know, that's, that's common for us now. That wasn't common in the first century. 
And uh, for for a man to express that kind of emotion, uh, that kind of feeling for for uh, for this for the people like that. Yeah. So even even politicians say uh, when somebody dies, our prayers and thoughts are with them, even though they don't. That's a generic thing. Yeah. Today is very generic, and some people, of course, mean it when they say, you know, you know, I love you with all my heart. They they mean it that you know they have all that passion. But in the ancient world, it was not a common thing. Yet Paul here is expressing there's. Again, there's just a deep, it's, it's, this is a great letter to read because so many times when we're reading letters from Paul, we're dealing with antagonism. You know, we read Galatians and it was like, oh my goodness. Correcting yeah. somebody. You no, know, he has to, he's massively beating on them because they're behaving so badly and they're on the brink yeah. of, a, they're, they're on the brink of apostasy and he has to rebuke them so harshly. In Corinthians, forget about it, the most immoral pigs you can imagine. He's like, is this a church? Is that your that's why people tell me, oh, the church today is so bad. Really, I don't think you've read your Bible. I don't think people read their mm, Bible. I know. I've never, you know, in all, in all my years of ministry, I've never had a Corinthian church, thank God. You know, I've had, I've had, we've seen, I've seen, you know, ever since I became a Christian, I've seen problems in churches. I've never seen the Corinth, a Corinthian church, okay? I saw how bad they are. And I've never seen a Galatian church either. I've never seen a church on the brink of leaving the gospel, leaving the teachings of Christ. I've never, thank God. Uh, so, you know, but Philippians is just, uh, it's for what Paul had to deal with. Philippians is a, is a great joy for him, uh, you know, to be able to deal with them. So, yeah, uh, very different. So, we, so we're getting a different, a different viewpoint, uh, how Paul relates to a church when there is no animosity, when he can just tell them about the, the greatness of Christ and about the great friendship that they share in Christ and the great love that they have for each other. Again, so much so that this is one of the few letters where he doesn't have to mention he's an apostle because right. issues of authority are not there. Uh, and he's even tender in the way that he deals with his women and says, you know, let's, let's, let's take care of this. Let's fix this. We can do this, you know. Any, 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 anything else? Any other questions? Mm -mm. Paul encourages believers going through hardship to rejoice, to give thanks, to pray. Again, he is in prison. Uh, and yet he's telling them to rejoice, keep, keep praying, uh, keep being thankful. Uh, and he's preaching, of course, to them, and there are people who are also going through suffering. They're also being persecuted, so they understand. Um, he doesn't simply preach the gospel. He lives the gospel. You know, Paul doesn't say to them, oh, rejoice and be thankful. And you know, we know he does, because we know that when he was in Philippian jail, he was singing praises to God. He was, you know, he really, this is, the, you know, there's some Christians that might say to you, oh, rejoice, be thankful. But when they're in a jam, when, when, they, when, they, when, they're, when they're being crushed, they're like, God, stop it. Uh, you know, maybe cursing, maybe being angry, whatever. Uh, Paul wasn't that kind of guy. He really, he really believed that, you know, God is, God is working in the midst of all this. And even, even when bad things are happening, God is still there and God is still working. And maybe we can't see it. We can't see how God is working and we can't understand it, but God is working. And so we should be thankful because Christ is Lord. Christ is in charge. He is King. Um, and so we can rest assured that he'll take care of everything. You know, like he says in Romans, that God works all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Uh, this is Paul. This is really who Paul is. So he really believes this stuff and he lives this stuff. Uh, any questions? Mm -mm. Verse three, I thank my God every time I remember you. Uh, thanksgiving and prayer in Paul are always directed towards God. Uh, the my, which occurs in each of the his thanksgiving, where the verb is singular, denotes personal relationship. Like, you know, many times you'll see this in the Psalms. The Lord, my God, you know, uh, it's, it's language of being personal. It, it isn't simply that he prays to God. Oh, God. No, he's my God. There, there is a relationship that he has with the living God. And it is the language undoubtedly of the Psalms. When you see in the Psalms, even when you read the Psalms that are like most heart-wrenching, it's still talking to God as my God. Where are, oh, where are you, my God? You know, I'm going through this, through this hell. Where are you? You know, it's still a language of intimacy. And Paul has that same thing when he talks to God in his prayers. It's that same language uh, of intimacy. Um, verses four through six. It is also Paul's habit not only to note that he thanks God for his friends, but also 
that he does so regularly, always, and that such thanksgiving is a regular part of prayer for him. Prayer, uh, Paul, Paul doesn't say, you know, doesn't talk, think about the Philippians and thanks God once for them. You know, he prays for them continually. And when they come to his mind in prayer and he's praying for them and for their needs and their concerns, he's always thankful to God because of them. Again, he's not thankful for the Galatians because what they're going through and what they're doing. On the contrary, mm -hmm. he, he, there is no, if you notice again, remember, remember Galatians, there was no uh, sweet words like this and no prayer requests. He, he, jumped, he jumped right into, you know, who's enticed you? Why are you, why are you departing? So who's, why are you leaving the faith? What's going on here? Why, why, why are you becoming a turncoat and uh, becoming the enemy of God? Uh, here you see the, the language of intimacy and again being, you know, it's so, know. it's so wonderful when you think about a Christian and every, every time you pray for them, you're, you're able to be thankful to God for them because you can see that they have the love of Christ, they're maturing, they care, they have, you know, it's wonderful. Instead of having to pray for a Christian when you're like, oh Lord, stop them, Lord, help them, they're 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 you know they're back they're they're backsliding they're doing this it's so wonderful to say you know every time you mention a person say god i just i thank you for them i just thank you for their testimony i thank you for their partnership he thanks him for thanks god for the partnership and the gospel they work together uh to minister to others it's again it's it's very uh, very heartwarming any question mm -hmm. um when he does offer up prayer for them now meaning of course petition he does it with joy. Whatever else the Philippians meant to Paul, they were for him a cause of great joy. Joy, it should be noted, lies at the heart of the Christian experience. And, and as we've dealt, as we dealt in Galatians, we're dealing also with the sermons. Joy is part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And joy, of course, um, I, you know, I, I just read recently a translation. What was it? You know, and I like certain parts of it. It was the Christian um, CEV, Contemporary English Version. You know, and I was trying it. And, you know, it's funny. I, I, there was things about it that I really loved. But then when it dealt with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it said, you know, uh, love, peace, happiness, or happy. And, and I was like, no, no, oh, oh, that really was bad. Joy and happiness are not the same thing at all, at all. Of course happy, not. Happiness depends upon circumstances. If sure, external circumstances. Excuse me? external circumstances exactly it, it, you know if if things are going bad you're not happy if things are going good you're happy it's a fickle yeah. thing it's based but joy is based upon our relationship with jesus christ it's based sure. upon who we are in christ and what christ is doing through us it's not so the circumstances can change paul's mm -hmm. in prison paul's in prison and yet he can rejoice he can have joy. Why? Because he knows that he's in the hands of God. He knows that no matter what happens, whether it's sunny or rainy, God is God. God's in control. The Lord will take care of everything. It's completely radically different. So again, you know, it's just a shame. And sometimes translations, in, in order to try to be contemporary, they, they mess it up. And that's one place where I was, I was listening to his translation, you know, going through the Pauline letters. I said, oh, when he got to that word, oh, man, it was like someone stabbed me with a knife. I said, these are biblical scholars. These are, they should know better. This is not the right word sure. at all. You know, I mean, kara, joy is joy. is not, It's not happiness. I can't even think of what, I can't even think of there is a Greek word that Paul used, that's used in the New Testament to say happiness. You know, even when they do, uh, even when they do the Beatitudes in Matthew, and, and you see sometimes there's a translation, I think it's the, uh, the, the good news when it says, happy are those, uh, you know, instead of blessed are those. Uh, no, the word makarias is not, it means blessed. Those who are fortunate because, you know, uh, things are things are good for them because God is on their side and God is for them. Not because circumstances are good. You know, happy is he who mourns. No, of course not. Hmm. The person who's mourning is not happy. They're sad. Um, it, but they are. I mean, I mean, last week we were talking about the the uh, the first verse, Paul and Timothy servants, and we were talking that he's not servants; he's really a slave. Yeah. And uh, I checked the uh, the versions, and uh, King James has bond servant. New King oh. James has bond servant. Yeah. All the the only the only translation that has a slave is the NLT. 
no living See, translation. That's the it, only translation that has a slave. Isn't that weird? You see, and some things it is weird. Again, like the NLT, sometimes I really love it. I think it's really cool. And sometimes, sometimes they yeah. water things down so much. I know. And that's why that's why I stick to the NIV because the NIV to me is like a, a mid ground. Right. It's still respectable enough where when you water that when you water things too much, then what you're reading is something different than than yeah, the, what, what, Greek or what is meant. Person. Yeah. So that, that becomes bad. And and to and, and anytime you see the word joy be translated in the Bible as, as happy, it loses out because people always think I, I can't imagine anyone who thinks of happy as anything other than everything is cool for me, everything is wonderful. And that's not what it means. Things can be miserable yeah. for you, like Paul, sure. he's in prison, but yet he has the joy of the Lord. And and the and the Philippians are suffering, and yet he can tell them, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. This is the letter where he talks about it. He mentions joy here more than anywhere else, and yet this is the suffering church. Here's a church that's going through so much, uh, so much hell, uh, and Paul himself is going through, and yet he still is able to hold on to it. Um, so I have a question: How does joy in the Lord uh, manifest in you? Uh, do you have a sense of uh, peace and tranquility uh, when you have joy, even though the circumstances are adverse? Yes. Yes. Because, because your confidence rests in Christ and in the Holy Spirit, who's working through all these things. You know, when you're a Christian, you're able to see what others cannot see. And even, mm -hmm. when, you, and even when you cannot see it, you still trust God. You still know that God right. is there. God is going to... God, you know, I don't understand why I'm going through this pain. I don't know why I'm going through this, Lord. But I know that you're going to work through it. You know, like, for example, you know, when I went through the through the pain that I went through, which really I would not not wish it upon anyone. It was really horrible for me. I, I, they just, I, not, and not being able to figure out exactly what was going on with me was even worse. Um, but, you know, I did learn, I understood what Paul meant when he said that in my weakness the the, the power of god has been demonstrated it, it it was at that time when i realized that wow this is definitely from god uh it, this cannot be attributed to me the fact that i it, is, it, it comes to mind well what i read once there was a, a written uh there was this was written in the wall in the basement of uh in germany during World War II, some Jewish people wrote something on the wall that said that uh, I believe in the sun, you know, the sun, even though when it's not shining. I believe in love, even though sometimes I don't feel it. And I live in God, even though, even when he's silent. Mm. And it was, it was written by somebody, I guess it was meant by, you know, Jewish people that were hiding yeah. from the Nazis. And they left yeah, that. That 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 to me is the is that is that kind of transcendent relationship that you have, that you put your confidence in God, and you know that God is good. God is good. If you if you if you, if you don't know that God is good, then then you have something to worry about because then you have to worry about. If you think that then you have to worry about, you have to worry about. You as a person have to worry about. Yeah, because if you, because you don't believe God is good, then the worry is on you. Yeah, because no, no, no. Because the worst thing is the worst thing is not oh there is no God. The worst thing is oh there's an evil God, or this is the way or this is the way God really is. And you know if you think about some people's theology, I mean I'm not going to call out names on a certain theologies, but there's certain theologies that make it sound like God, like that God predestined. For example, like you same someone saying I get cancer, oh that was the will of God. God wanted me to have cancer. I was like, no, what kind of God do you have? That's crazy. <laughs> you have cancer because you're 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 a fallen creature in a fallen world, and things mm. go bad in a fallen world. But to me, evil, disease, all these things are not from God. God is good. You know, that's like saying, I would why would I viciously torment my daughter? For some other greater good, I wouldn't do that. God, God is not like that. See, I, so again, if, if you don't see this concept of God is good, if you don't understand this, 
then I can see how you can get lost in, in the pain and the suffering and thinking God is tormenting me. You know, God is doing this to me. Mm. Like even Job, Job had a, a warped theology because he thought it was God doing it. He never thought there was a, a, a malicious force uh, called Satan <laughs> right. that would want to harm you or hurt you. He just thought everything came from God, all the good, all the bad. No, but God doesn't do that. God is good. You know, God does not sin. God does not tempt you. Uh, this is not how the God is. God is a good God. Now, once you understand that and you know that he loves you, then, of course, you realize you know, bad things happen because we live in a fallen world and we're fallen creatures. Sometimes it happens because we're stupid. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> you, you know, you, you, know you, you did something you weren't supposed to do and you end up having an accident. It was your fault. It wasn't God who did it. It was your fault. You're dumb. You know, but be honest, you're dumb. We're dumb animals. You know, there's a, there's a psalm that I love. I can't, oh, I, can't, I, I forgot which psalm it is. But it says, I'm like a dumb animal that you have to keep maneuvering. Mm. Keep going, I keep going this way and that way. And you keep trying to straighten me out because I'm like this stupid animal that keeps doing this. And that, you know, but if you realize, to me, it's like God is good and God is loving. And I do not believe that any evil is from God. Uh, I don't believe that God desires to harm he doesn't want anyone to perish. Uh, he wants to see everybody saved. Um, you know, he may allow certain things in our lives. And when he allows them, again, it's because he knows that he can use it within our lives to bring about hmm. a greater good. If God were allowed to allow evil in my life, just for the sake of evil, that, that would make him a, 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 a sadistic God, uh, that he likes to, to harm people. no. He knows that evil does occur because we live in a world where there is free will and we choose to do bad things. And we have evil forces, you know, Satan, the demonic world that's seeking to harm us. And even there, he manipulates that because, again, even Job, uh, he told Satan, you can do this, but you can't do that. You can do you can go this far, but you can't go this far. You know, so even there, he puts uh, restrictions on the things that can happen to us. But when he allows it to happen, it's because he knows he can work something out uh, for our greater good and for his glory. Uh, so, again, when you have that kind of confidence, that kind of God, you, I don't know, you can live a little bit. <laughs> it's a little easier to breathe. I just can't imagine having a God that you believe actually is tormenting you on purpose. For, well, sometimes the uh, language, sometimes the language is confusing because when, when you read uh, First Samuel and talk about soul, when we say there, an evil spirit came from the Lord and took over soul. Yes. Yes. Again, when I, when I read stuff like that, I, I comprehend it perfectly because I know that, first of all, like you see in the book of Job, which is, again, this is the way the Hebrew people thought. The, all angels had to come and give an account to God, whether fallen or not fallen. Uh, Satan mm -hmm. is a fallen angel, but yet he's still accountable to God. So what happened to Saul, Saul was disobedient to God. Saul had right. knelt. Again, it was not that Saul was like David and he was being he behaving nicely towards God and doing things God wanted. He did evil. He just did bad. And so God allowed this evil spirit to go and torment Saul. Now, it should have led to it should lead to Saul's repentance and turn around. But he won't because he's he's hardened against God. But it's not mm. God. It's not God who's doing this. It's Saul who's doing this. And so, yes, God will permit. Again, nothing can happen to us that God has not permitted. You know, it is within the permissive will of God. But it's not to me the ordained will of God. It's not like God wanted, you know, this is what he wanted. He knows this was going to happen. So he allows it. And he works in the middle of it. Now, if God knew so, that... So and it's kind of Saul left the door open for evil Saul, to come in. Saul left many doors open. Saul was was so ungodly. He was pathetic. I mean, I, I feel well, first of all, I feel bad for Saul. Because first of all, he was only chosen because he was tall and strong. He was not chosen because he was holy and great. You know, he was not he was mm. not a man after God's own heart at all. The people picked him as their leader. God did not pick him. The people picked him. And uh and and he just met, he went from one mess up to another mess up very badly. It was just like I mentioned, uh, I think it was this Sunday, I was mentioning the Eli, the priest. 
Like, yeah. Even even God even warns him through Samuel through a boy. And you know what is Eli? What is Eli's final re, final thing that he says? Well, let the Lord's will be done. Oh, come on. If you were to be a righteous man, if you were to do the righteous thing, stop your sons from doing the evil that they're doing, you'll be fine. But he makes it sound like he's being like he's surrendering to the will of God. No, you're being evil. You're allowing your sons to commit all kinds of atrocities as they serve the Lord. And so, of course, you're going to be judged. Of course, God's going to remove you. But he's giving you time to repent and you won't repent, which is what Paul tells us in Romans. When God relents, when God hasn't punished you, when God is not it's because God is giving you time to repent. God is merciful. God is kind. Again, everything I see from God in the Bible is good. And when I see the evil aspects, I don't see evil. I see that God is punishing. You know, Pharaoh hardens his heart against God. He torments the people of God. And then when he wants to relent, God says, no, 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 no. Not yet. Not yet. We still have more work to be done here. So I'm now I'm going to harden your heart. You want to harden your heart? Now I'm going to do it. But that doesn't mean, of course, that Pharaoh ends up in hell. He can still mm-hmm. repent. He can still be saved. It was a hardening to accomplish a certain job. So now, again, again, it's it's what perspective do you have of God? And if you see God as like this uh, malicious uh, being who doesn't want me to have fun, who's looking for any opportunity to harm me, who's trying to stop me from doing anything that I enjoy, I was like, no. I mean. If you think about it, look how much God has created in this world. If God really was such a selfish, horrible God, he wouldn't even, he wouldn't even have made a woman for man. He would have said, no, he's all mine. He's going to worship me and adore me, and I'm not going to share him with anybody. I mean, think about in your life how many people God shares you with, you know? Mm-hmm. And, he does, and he doesn't begrudge that. He enjoys that. He enjoys that you're with somebody else, that you're with your family and your friends. and always, He enjoys it. He doesn't, he doesn't begrudge us. I, again, I, I I have a very my I, I think my perspective of God is a very mature perspective that the God that I see is good and he demonstrates all his goodness and he really is loving. Um, mm-hmm. Can can he be wrathful? Yes, but even when he has wrath against who? Against the children of disobedience, not against anybody. Just not. It's not like oh God's just angry. No, he's angry. What in Romans chapter one? What is those who are unrighteous, those who had the witness of God before them and they could have obeyed God, but instead of obeying God, they turn against God. And so now God's wrath is upon them, but not upon us. You know, God's love is demonstrated to us. I mean, I mean, think of all the things that we do. How many times we sin? How many times we right. mess up? And God doesn't squash us. And the contrary, he's very patient with us, very loving. So again, I, I guess it's how, you know, and I think if you face if you face tribulation and you know God is good and God is loving, and God is working in everything, God is sovereign. Uh, I think you you can rejoice, I, even though even though you feel miserable, even though you're in a prison and things are really you know are really bad, you can still rejoice. You still find reasons yeah. to rejoice, which which we'll see uh, how Paul does end up also rejoicing at uh, at, at different things as well. I see. Where are we going to go here? See if we can. Maybe I may want to stop before I go to that section. Okay, let's do one more section here. Uh, Paul now offers a brief word as to the base of his joy, which also serves as further reason for his thanksgiving. The reason expressed in terms of partnership. Again, remember, partnership is the word koinonia, which we already, you know, right. you're going to be learning Greek along the way. Uh, koinonia, which you, you normally translate fellowship. Um, so they have a partnership, a business partnership in the spreading of the gospel and focus on the long enduring nature of this participation. Um, again, for Paul, is that the, the Philippians have become partners with him. They're financially supporting him. Uh, they're praying for him. They're being a source of encouragement. Him, and all that is a partnership working together. Uh, and again, when we think of fellowship, we, we, we're too stuck on the coffee and cake. And uh, Christians have to get past mm. coffee and cake time and real, realize that fellowship, uh, partnership, fellowship, partnership is much more than that. Uh, and Paul's theology certainly means more than sharing coffee and cake. It is more than belonging to a group. It means belonging to one another. It means that we share each other's sorrows and we share each other's joys. Um, and it's because they are, because they are sorrow and joy, we partake of that with them. 
Uh, this is why we share with those who don't have believers. You know, like we saw in Second Corinthians eight, where Paul talks about uh, the famine that is going on in Jerusalem, and the believers there are struggling, and other believers who have money are helping out, and we do that all the time. If you think about Christians all the time, we do that. We hear about Christians who are suffering somewhere somewhere in the world, and we financially mm -hmm. help them out in one way or another because we're sharing in their suffering. We feel their pain. You know, these mm -hmm. poor Christians who are who are who are going right right now. We have the whole situation going on in Sudan or the poor Sudan. The poor Christians there have suffered so so much, and now we'll continue to suffer. So of course, when we have an opportunity to help them, of course we're going to help them because we feel their pain. I already feel I've already felt their pain for many years because the Sudan has been such a such a bloodbath for Christians. Such persecuted Christians are persecuted so badly in the Sudan. Uh, I mean, if it was up to me, I would just take all the Christians out of the Sudan. You know, and, and say God judges this place. This, now you can destroy it like Sodom and Gomorrah. The Christians are out. You can destroy it. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's just so horrendous for them. But you know, we share again. Uh, this is the language that Paul uses when we talk about that we share together in the body and blood of Christ. When we talk about the, the, the Lord's table, the Lord's fellowship. We share with one body, we partake of the, of the body of Christ. Uh, we share in the gospel, as we do here. He talks about how we share in the sufferings of Christ, how we share together uh, in one faith. Uh, so again, all this all this involves all that, and the partnership, of course, is in the gospel. And the gospel is uh, again just like we know koinonia. Gospel is evangelium, evangelium. Mm -hmm. and, and there I am going to stop because I have much more to talk about evangelium. So I want I'll, I'll finish with partnership. We have partnership, okay. but it's in the gospel. And next week we're going to get into deeper sense of what the gospel means. Uh, and what it meant for Paul and what it should mean for us. Because sometimes, you know, we just have the word gospel and uh, we, we really don't know the depth of, of the, what that word means. Uh, right. Any questions? Any any comments? Uh, no, no. Okay, great. Let me well, say, say goodbye to Facebook. Facebook, good night. Good night. Oh, let me stop the recording here.